Welcome to our webinar today. We're going to talk about branding luxury. Um, I'm your host, Cynthia Sterling. But before we get started with our content, I want to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. At the bottom of your Zoom window, if you scroll down, a little toolbar should pop up. And in there, you'll see a Q&A button. If you click on that, it will open up the Q&A box, and that's how you can ask us questions. So the first thing I'd like to do is make sure that's working and that you guys can all hear us. So could you please type into the question pane where you're from and what kind of product um, you're, you're in the business of um, marketing? Ah, okay, great. We're getting some um, activity in here. We've got people in fine wine, um, people from all over California, and I'm sure all over the country. Lots of wine I'm seeing. It's popping by pretty fast. Okay, thank you guys so much. I'm excited because we are going to be focusing quite a bit on alcohol beverage. Um, but that said, a lot of everything that we talk about will be applicable to any luxury, in particular food and beverage um, product. So I think you'll find it really valuable. And I uh, want to introduce myself in a little bit more depth. I am the founder and creative director of, I need to get the slides to advance, of Sterling Creative Works. We are a strategy, branding, and packaging design agency dedicated to building standout premium and luxury wine, spirits, and food brands. Um, I've had the privilege to work with some of the smartest marketing minds in the business. And over the course of my career, my focus has been on understanding how to capture consumers' attentions, but then deliver a truly delightful experience so that they, they become loyal consumers. And we have with us today, Franck Benuron, who is a professor of marketing at CSU Northridge. And he's also the president of Commandant House of Cognac. I hope I said that right, Franck. That's good. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, he's coming all the way uh, via video to us from Cognac, France, and his historic home there, which is a beautiful, we got a little uh, video tour of it the other day. It's a beautiful old stone house, um, very uh, much a sort of romantic luxury concept. Um, he is a luxury marketing professor, researcher, and practitioner. So he teaches luxury marketing. He's done quite a bit of research into exactly what is luxury and how do you convey luxury. And then he owns a number of spirits brands, including this house of cognac. So I'm so glad you're with us today, Frank. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Thank you for having me. Very excited yeah. to. So, Luxury is an elusive concept. We know it when we see it, but how do we create it and how do we deliver it? Um, so today we're going to spend time exploring two key questions about branding luxury. So first, you know, what are the drivers of luxury perception? And secondly, how do we develop a roadmap for building and monitoring luxury positioning? We'll spend approximately 40 minutes understanding the definitions of luxury to a range of consumer types and the consumer motivations behind prestige purchases. Ronk is going to share how to use his brand luxury index, which I think you guys will find valuable. It's a tool to test your brand's luxury positioning. And then when he's done with his uh, part of the presentation, I'll get tactical with strategies for incorporating the right luxury cues into your packaging to attract that best fit consumer. We'll save time at the end of our prepared remarks for a live Q&A session so you can submit your questions to us at any time via that Q&A box and then at the end we will go through and answer as many as we can today. So what you'll learn today is the different levels of luxury brands the five key dimensions that motivate luxury purchases, leveraging the five dimensions to establish and maintain prestige over the long term, 
and then how to measure your brand's luxury level using the brand luxury index. And lastly, about, uh, we'll talk about incorporating luxury cues into your packaging to leverage the right luxury dimensions for your consumer. So, Frank, I'm going to hand the screen over to you now. We practiced this a little bit earlier, so bear with us. I am going to make Frank the host, and you're going to share your slides now. There we go. So, I'm going to turn uh, off my video camera to save bandwidth here, so I'll be back on for Q&A. Okay, what's interesting is the, just a second, the, ah, good. The, um, the, I started a long time ago in 93, working on luxury, and um, I was in, in Scotland at the time, and I was very interested, again, in, in spirits, obviously in Scotland, the most um, known uh, spirits. Uh, related to luxury is the Scotch whiskies. So I was living in the middle of so many different distilleries of Scotch whiskies, and I was uh, very interested in this, but I didn't work so much with Scotch whiskey at the time. Um, I was working with uh, Lotus, um, Jaguar, and Rolls-Royce in different field studies. And I was always wondering what was the different level of luxury between all of those brands, because they were they were somewhat seen different by different people in one being more luxurious than the other. So I was wondering, is there some kind of a way to measure which one is more luxurious and understand why one would be more luxurious than the other? And in fact, there could be different dimensions where one would be more luxurious, even though it would have some elements of luxury within that would be higher than the other. So it was somewhat something that I was... Uh, uh, abstract. It was very abstract, and I was just imagining it. So I started working on dimensions. I start looking at the concept of uh, brand luxury, and I developed a uh, brand luxury scale um, that was developed at the end of the uh, 1990s. And then I, I kept working on this through uh, between 2000 until today. So the idea is that there are many different cues that you need to um, implement. And these cues can be implemented, as you will see, through the packaging. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay. So the, the idea is that there, there are different levels of luxuries. And um, there are different brands that would be perceived as luxurious or not luxurious. So essentially, the concept of luxury is not... Uh, universal, but it's very dependent on the people that are making the measure. So one thing that may be seen luxurious by one person may not be seen as luxurious by another and, and, and vice versa. So it's very important to see, and that, that is something that I've done when I was doing consulting, is first decide what level of luxury that you want to reach, because there will be different level of implementation uh, in order to reach the higher levels. And so different strategies and obviously there would be different communication, different product qualities, different packaging and so forth. So you can break down luxury from the very, very highest level of luxury. So it's maybe a brand that people in general don't know because it's a brand that is not popular. Then you could have a high level of luxury that uh, is something that is perceived very luxurious and may be perceived by many people as being luxurious, then there's a medium level, then a low level, and then something that is questionably luxurious. And um, so when you do this, you're not looking at the universality of something being luxurious. You're looking at what one person thinks. So it's, it's at a person level that is very important. So when you um, sell a product, what is very important is to define your targets. And within your targets, the concept of luxury is what is very important. So an ultimate luxury brand, and here would be not just the brand, but it would be the model of spirit. I took an example of the Macallan rare casks. We could look even at more ultimate type of product when they make addition of very limited bottle and some huge crystal decanter within a huge box that they would not even advertise selling, that they would be sold from word of mouth, for example. Then a borderline luxury brand 
um, would be a black label um, um, Johnny Walker Scotch whiskey because, and I'm saying this would be from the perspective of, of a, the same person. So the same person may see those things being all luxurious, but within different level of luxury. They may be seen not luxurious at all by one person and the other one being at a higher at, or at a lo lower level of luxury. So the, um, the, the definite answer of what's luxurious and what's not luxurious is not so important. What's important is at the level of your target. What do they think is luxurious? When I was doing, uh, starting to do research um, in 93, I was reading all over the place all over the literature about luxury, and I found that luxury, there were very little written about it. But there was lots written about it from philosophy, from uh, so, so, social uh, science and economics, and uh, within various literature and even poetry and so forth. But I was more interested in the application in business. So then I found more literature on the luxury products. What is the definition of a luxury product? This is also not so interesting because I think when you develop a strategy for luxury, you should be really looking at the brand luxury. And so I found some literature on luxury brands, but not so much about brand luxury. So there's a little um, semantical um, concept that I want to show here. He's focusing at the, what is the definition of luxury. Not so important, what is a luxury brand? More important and even more important, what's brand luxury? So typically in the industry, you will see a definition of um, consumer, uh, such as the one on in this PowerPoint, where there will be very qualitative views on what do people have as characteristics of being a, a consumer of luxury. They are looking for deals, they're interested in the art, they have a specific age, they have specific brand preferences, they like this kind of. A, a quality level and so forth, but I, but I found this very um, airy fairy because I couldn't really use all of these definitions that you find from consulting firms or some uh, consumer research being usable across all brands. So I was trying to really develop a definition that would be usable uh, through all brands. So I was starting to think about some kind of code, genome, or DNA of luxury. What is the essence? of luxury, but beyond this, what is the essence of brand luxury? So the codes, the genomes, I thought of, of them being some kind of multi-dimensional concept that would have each one of those dimensions sub variables that once you measure the sub variables, they would aggregate to one of the dimension and they would allow the the company making the measurements to understand where do they fit within the scale, within the spectrum of brand luxury. So I created in, this was in 97, I think, the luxury typology, which is therefore based on those five dimensions. Um, what's important also for me to say, I think, is that I do speak English and I do speak French, I being French, and I was doing a constant uh, dialogue within the two culture where I was deriving the concepts in one and then testing it in the other and coming back and forth. Um, the literature back in the 90s was mostly French. So if you wanted to read about the subject of luxury brand, you had to read in French. Now this has dramatically changed, um, has dramatically changed because of uh, people doing research now in the United States, but not so much because of the United States. Most of the literature now comes from China. Uh, a huge amount of researchers are working in China, and most of them are using this simple typology that has been uh, uh, the, somehow the start of the, of the view of how you look at consumers. So the, the view is that there are five values that generate uh, five motivations. So the motivations give you essentially the type of targets uh, that you would be looking at uh, when uh, looking at the luxury consumption. Um, they are, um, I, I will go into the explanation of, of each one of them, but the idea is that consuming a luxury brand is about uh, the expression of the cost or the price, the perceived conspicuous value of 
that brand. So luxury brands are usually more expensive, but making a luxury brand or making a brand more expensive in hope that it would be perceived as luxurious is not sufficient. Um, the other concept is very important is that it cannot be owned by everyone. So it's a big balance because now you have the, the biggest trend in the luxury brand management is to create uh, global brands that are sold everywhere. And if they are sold everywhere, essentially you're going into a mass production. So it's becoming very difficult to balance between not being owned by everyone, but at the same time being in many different places. And so keeping the balance here is very important. There is also something to do with the, the perceived um, social value, uh, uh, the perceived value of, the, of who's using this luxury brand. So it's not for everyone, and it's somehow for an, an elite. It's uh, people who belong to a certain social class, uh, people who have a certain maybe status or role or position that will be consuming uh, luxury brands. Then the other thing is, it's not all about just what it makes you look like, but the luxury brand is about also the emotions that you would get from the use of this product. So it's supposed to be something that is uncommon and it, it will make you feel uh, much uh, different and it will generate more emotions. But there will be something to do with how it feels, how it looks. It would be different. It, it, and, and this generates the, the last one, which is it looks like it's a better quality product. So it has some elements, some characteristics that makes it better than anything else. Um, it may even be superfluous in terms of what it does, uh, because what it does is, is not something that you can use. I can think of a, a very powerful car, for example, that would go 200 miles an hour. Well, great, but you probably will never go 200 miles an hour with that car, but it is what it can do if you were to ever use it to the extreme. So that all of these elements are somehow the definition of the five views of what constitutes luxury uh, brand. And going to more depth is when we look at it, therefore, there are two higher level concepts. So there's five dimension, conspicuousness, uniqueness, quality, hedonic, and extend itself. And these break down into the personally oriented um, dimensions versus the non-personal oriented dimensions. So the most, it's also very interesting because within different culture, you would have different, all of these five seems to, to be stable across culture, but it's the weight of these that are uh, interesting. Um, in, um, in, in France, for example, they, they are very into the quality of the product and the definition of the quality of the product and the uniqueness of the product. Some other cultures, they would be more into the conspicuousness. And so very interesting to see that there's two factor personal versus um, interpersonal interacting. When I started doing this research, essentially those two perceptions existed, but nobody really had written anything by, by including both. So one of my co contribution was to actually discuss about both coexisting at the same time. So when you look at the interpersonal, what you have is you have someone who's very much trying to buy a luxury brand for the conspicuousness, for the fact that it's ostentatious, and that consumer is essentially called Veblenian. Um, Veblenian comes from Veblen, who was um, an author uh, in the United States who wrote a lot about conspicuous consumption, the leisure class, and that was uh, at the beginning of the um, 1900, he was talking about this idea that people would uh, have time, would spend money in, on, on the, um, leisure activities, and that was a sign to show that they had a higher social class. So ostentation is very important in luxury, here again, it's not sufficient. It's, it's often time one that everyone understands because it's very much revealed by the, the price. Perceive unique of uniqueness is this idea that people will want to have something that is different. And so to explain this one, I have to explain the social value at the same time because they are very a dynamic one with the other. So the snub effect 
And so it's not a negative word in that situation. The snob effect is very much someone who is an innovator. So it's someone who's going to try to look for the luxury brand that not everyone has and the luxury brand that has not been picked up yet. They're going to look for, um, for something that is so unique that it may be they're going to maybe be a trendsetter by using this luxury brand. So when you manage your luxury brands, you have to be very careful of those snobs. Those snobs are very important. They are the, the trendsetter for your luxury brand. Um, you have to be very careful because they, are the, they will be the first one to go away once your brand starting to lose some of that um, exclusivity. And so if you, your brand, you, you want to um, make more sales, you will probably lose the snub in order to gain what we call the bandwagon. So the bandwagon will be the people that will not be the first one to buy. They will look for some kind of uh, agreement, some kind of consensus within the, uh, the market for luxury brand being, becoming the uh, most common luxury brand. So just to give you a, an example that comes to my mind right now, um, if you're in France, you see um, a Lexus uh, probably one, if you drive on the freeway, you see one every five hours, every 10 hours maybe you see one. Versus if you are in, um, in California, in the United States, and you're on the freeway, you see one every five seconds. You know? So they... Um, the people who are buying uh, the Lexus in France probably will be the snob and versus in the USA will be the bandwagon. So there will be a consensus for that specific brand and they will be the brand that maybe it's expected to buy. So every luxury brand goes through this and it's a, it's a question about which level of luxury you want to reach. Because if you're appealing mostly to the snob, you probably will go to, to a higher level of luxury. And you have, if you're appealing mostly to the bandwagon, you probably will reach a lower level of luxury. So, um, so the, um, the concept that you're measuring when you're looking at conspicuousness, so as one of the main dimension, is first conspicuousness, which is an issue of do people think it's extraordinary and very visible and, and things like that. Is it extremely expensive? Is it for people that perceive with a, having uh, some monetary, uh, discretionary monetary, uh, having people from some kind of elite? That's, these are the elements behind conspicuousness. Uniqueness is a concept are made of concept for concepts. So it's something that is rare that you don't see as often ex exclusive, it's not for everyone, it's unique, so maybe there's some elements that are very original, it's very precious, maybe there's character um, elements that makes it um, more, uh, less common than others. Then the extent itself on social value here is, it's the notion that if you uh, have a luxury brand, there is some elements of power and perceived success. Maybe you're someone who is not following but you may be leading you may be someone important and you may be also an element that you are able to reward yourself more than others um, now i'm moving into the personal effect so again the personal effect is the emotional value um, so the emotional value is what it's called the hedonistic consumer so the hedonistic consumer is someone that will consume luxury brands because of the pleasure that they're going to gain from the consumption. So when you look at motivation and you look at the basic um, triangle pyramid of um, Maslow's motivation, um, Maslow's motivation would have something from the very basic uh, biological needs, which would be the essential things that you will try to satisfy first. Then you will try to satisfy other needs such as being part of a group and then the higher need from that is being recognized having some power within the group and then the higher need from this is this need of feeling good about yourself independently from what anyone may think you're just doing something that actualizes you so the consumption of luxury may have this element of actualizing 
where you don't care so much what other people think. It's very personal, but it's something that makes you feel good. It pleases you. Um, it is very emotional, and it's just it's it maybe talks about who you are, and you're not we're not trying to say about who you're trying to be. Then the the perceived quality is um, is this notion of being a perfectionist. So you will hope to get or you will seek being a perfectionist in buying a luxury brands because within this brand there will be elements that you just know that this there's nothing better than this. So you just had the opportunity with a luxury brand to buy the best product that there is. All of these elements uh, within quality are within the variable of being crafted. So it's somewhat handmade or it's made in in um, in a way that it's made by people by hand. Um, the elements of quality directly being high quality, low quality. Again, here you have just the, the pure um, notion and definition of luxury versus non-luxury. And this was an item that I've kept within the scale because it gives you some kind of way to see how close you are from the, the, the essential basic concept of luxuries versus non-luxuries. And then there's the element of sophistication. Luxury is, um, for the most part, very sophisticated. So sometimes the sophistication is, appears as something very simple and as very pure, but this purity it was not done as something casual. It was the, the artwork of someone that knew what they were doing. And this amount of knowledge created something simple, but at the end it's very sophisticated because there's a lot of depth. So the more depth, the more luxurious, the less depth, the less luxurious, even to a point that there may be no level of luxury. And then it's superior, which means that when you look at it against other things, it's just much better. The hedonism um, dimension is measured by some uh, sense of it's exquisite, so it's just something that uh, makes your senses uh, excited. It's glamorous, so there's something about elements of fashion in there and it's stunning. Again, it's exquisite, stunning. It's this element that you just think it's just gorgeous or something very aesthetically appealing. So once again, all of them united makes it um, difficult because you may think this is, this is a lot of things to do at the same time. But these are essentially, there's, there's more than all of these, but these are the, the, the minimum amount of within five elements that you need to look at. Also, I'd, li I'd like to say is that people may be a combination of these, which means that you're not just an hedonist or just a perfectionist. You may be a perfectionist and a Veblenian. So you may have 10% of one, 20% of the other, and the remaining on, a, on another one. So what's interesting is to know, one, who are your customers and where do they belong and how do they see your, your luxury brand? but also to measure your luxury brand and see how it fits for each one of your customers to see if you can actually manipulate those uh, dimensions. So the brand luxury index, which is available um, on the internet because when I published um, the, the scale in multiple journals, uh, it became a public domain so anyone can use it and it's used by many consulting firms and um, luxury companies. Um, it's uh, one of the most uh, read uh, article on luxury on, on the internet. And so you can go and find the scale, but it looks like this. So you find all the uh, dimensions, the five dimensions on the left side, conspicuousness, uniqueness, quality, hedonism, extend itself. And then you'll find all the different variables within the dimensions. And they are uh, organized within the bipolar scale. So a bipolar scale, that means um, that you have two adjectives and each one is, uh, they are extremes. So they are not 100% extremes, like cold and hot. They are more like a, war, like a hot and warm. Why is this? Because the, the spectrum for luxury is very narrow. So you could not have a hot and cold because you'll be missing all the subtle, subtle uh, nuances so everything has to be broken down in, into a much uh, narrower spectrum. So exquisite, tasteful, glamorous, attractive. And so it's, you see, best quality, good quality. It's not best quality, 
bad quality because you could not measure luxury. So everything that is being measured with this scale is are things that are assumed to have some level of luxury. So you wouldn't want to measure, um, um, I'm not sure what to say, I don't want to ding on anyone, but if you were to measure, let's say, Toyota, um, probably would not work very well. So you would have to, to use something which already deemed to be luxurious, like I mentioned, Lexus. So here is uh, some results uh, looking at uh, whiskey brands using the brand luxury index. So you have McAllen, Glenlivet, Chivas, Glenfiddich, and then Johnny Walker. And then you have, um, for each brand, you have a different color, and you have each one of the, um, the items or the, the dimensions at the bottom. So for wealthy and for well-off, for example. So you can see that McAllen is high in luxury and versus um, Johnny Walker is much lower in, um, in luxury. So what you do is you can get the average of all of these, and then you get an average of luxury for each one of them. But you can also look at each one of those elements, and this has many implications, such as being able to see where are we high, where are we weak, what can we do to change this? Is this a product change that is required, or is this something that has to do with communication that we need to make some changes? So. If we have to look at, um, I can't see too much on my on the right, but I see up to leading. And if you were to look at McAllen, the highest one is successful. So that's the highest characteristics. However, you can see that um, stunning is the lowest uh, characteristics for McAllen. Uh, however, you can look at the other brands, and each one of the brands can actually see how do they fit with each one of the characteristics. So sometimes you could have a high score or low score, but it could be dinged by just a few characteristics that are essentially extremely high or extremely low, and then you want to work on the, on the one that are the highest extreme. Here we're looking at another brand uh, that are deemed to be luxurious, again, so I use Godiva and Lint. Um, those brands may be seen more luxurious in some markets than some others. Um, lint may be seen as not luxurious in some market at all. I can think of that. But here, these were um, data that were taken in the United States. And you can see the different uh, characteristics for each one of the, of the brands where um, Godiva overall is doing much better. And you can see where some of, of the other elements where um, Lint will be better than Godiva. So even though Godiva will be slightly better on average. There would be a very close result at the end because of the unbalance um, rating within uh, each one of the variables. So knowing this information as a brand, you want to try to maybe understand what the, the other brands are doing in order to have a higher score or find what the consumer will want you to do in order to raise those scores. All right. So let's talk about some practical implications. And um, one of the things that Frank and I have been lamenting prior to this event is that there's this topic is so deep and um, there are so many facets to understand. Um, but what we want to do is give you an overview and um, get your wheels turning in your head about some of this information. So the yes, brand so. equity, why don't you talk about this and I'll move the slides forward and then we'll get into okay. how we apply this. Okay, so essentially the, um, the brand luxury index allows you to measure your brand equity. And so the outcome of measuring the brand equity is simply to evaluate your positioning. So where are you, how are you perceived within luxury? So you can have a, um, a spectrum of within luxury, are you high, are you low? But you can also see within each one of those um, viable which one has the highest impact? Do you, do you want your luxury brand to be perceived to be for very successful people? Or do you want your luxury brand to be perceived as the highest quality or very, being very exclusive? If you want to be very exclusive, and in fact you have very high score and quality and, and some of, of the other dimensions, then you have the opportunity to see and, and to make some changes in order to either change your positioning or um, change the impact of your variable. 
you can also look at your competitors and see how you fit and where you stand uh, within your market in terms of luxury competitiveness. And you can also make some, some strategic evaluation. So strategic evaluation is, is the simple thing that I can think of right now is, is in terms of quality. You have high exclusivity, you're very expensive, you, um, people have a lot of pleasure using, using your product, they think it's for important people and so forth, but they don't see the product uh, working as well as it should be. So strategic evaluation is to a new product design or something like that. But I know you will be talking about the packaging, which is very important because the packaging may be an element that actually is, could be improved in order to, to raise your perceived luxury and be measured by the Brian Luxury Index. Okay, so um, what's, uh, what's very important here again is the interest of measuring luxury just for the sake of luxury is not very uh, interesting. The measuring uh, luxury for trying to see which universal brand is higher than the other one is not so interesting either. What's interesting is who are your targets and what do they think about your brand? And what do they think about your brand in terms of their perception of how luxurious is your brand? So you can see who within your targets think it's luxurious. So you could find out that women think that your uh, perceived luxury through the VLI, the brand luxury index is very high and the men is very low. What is it that the men see? Why is it that the men would see it lower? And then you find the particular dimension that they see it lower and then you can work on this. And again, positioning and repositioning and using the scale until, until you reach the point of uh, be, being perceived as, as higher. Um, I have multiple luxury brands and I use this all the time. I use this on a weekly basis because that's how I keep track about my, my customers perceive uh, luxury about my brand. And I want to be perceived as luxurious, but then I want to be able to evaluate how I perceive in order to make some changes. So, can a luxury brand have something for everyone? That is essentially impossible. And I see a lot of democratization in, in luxury brand management where they're trying to make brands available for everyone. And they're essentially making it mass, so it's, it's what is called mastige. Mastige is mass prestige. And once you start doing this, you really damage your brand and it's, it's going to be very difficult for you to become a true luxury brand. So the answer is no. Can a non-luxury brand become luxury? And the answer is yes, you can. And so I'm, I've been working for the past uh, seven years on a brand of Brandy that was not a luxury brand. And now we are perceived as one of the highest uh, brand of, lux of Brandy, of luxury Brandy. And um, we have one of the uh, most expensive luxury for sale right now. It's about 10,000 euros. So it's uh, 13,000, 12,000 US dollar for one bottle. So it's possible. What is the worst move a brand can make that lowers its luxury value? I think it's when you start doing the mastiche, when you start um, extending your brand into different categories where you don't belong to, when you start changing your distribution, where you start being consistent in your quality, when you start just raising the prices and not the quality of your product, when you start having too many customers, when you don't understand the, the dynamic between the bandwagon and the snob. Um, when also, the, it's oftentimes when the brand is being sold to a huge corporation that's going to deal with this luxury brand as if it was a detergent or something, and mm -hmm. that also damage the, um, the luxury value. Okay, now it's um, when I'm going to talk about the packaging cues that create a luxury perception. So before we went live, Frank and I spoke briefly about a lot of producers are really committed to creating a quality product, a luxury quality product itself, which of course is essential to creating a luxury brand. But the overall experience that you're delivering to consumers 
both at the, the moment of purchase as well as in the usage situation once they take it home or consume it, that is heavily impacted by the packaging and what it's communicating and to whom. So I wanted to go through some of the uh, dimensions that Frank talked about and just quickly look at a few ways that we might apply or communicate those dimensions to the right audience via packaging. So first off, quality cues. Frank talked about the importance of technical superiority and the extreme care that takes place during the production process in creating luxury value. So what are we some ways that we can signal these qualities consumers? So quality ingredients and messaging um, about that handmade process and the sourcing of those superior ingredients. So here on this package, you can see that um, the certified sustainability will resonate with certain group of consumers because it implies more care and attention to detail as well as an environmental benefit. And this sub-appellation, Arroyo Seco Mont Monterey, is also an important differentiator between you know, a Pinot Noir that might come from a broader appellation and therefore be perceived as lower luxury value. Handcrafted elements. This is a bottle of Maker's Mark, of course. And handcrafted elements imply, when you have them on the package, they implicitly communicate a handcrafted approach to the product itself. It makes it feel like there's, it's more rare and precious, and that, again, more care has gone into the making of it. So hedonic experiential cues. Um, you know, what are some of those we might incorporate into packaging design? So tactile materials things that you can touch that give um, uh, more engagement and are satisfying to the touch can be a valuable add-on for packaging. And then the visual richness of a packaging, of a package design, of course, conveys quality. So here we have a label that has a pearlescent treatment across the artwork and it is sculptured in boss. It's also very minimal. So we associate things like pearls with luxury items. And then also we're letting the product really shine through, through the shorter label area. And that whole sort of visual experience is very appetizing. And then, you know, there's little delightful touches that again, Communicate that there is a person behind this who truly cares in the making of the product and is um, paying attention to those details. So things like um, the little poem on the right by Pablo Neruda and the layering of elements and the, the uncoated paper and the difference between the the surface um, shine of the, the seal that is established 1971 and that uncoated paper, as well as the embossing and the detailing, convey depth. And like Franck said, you know, depth is one of those things that we expect from a luxury product. Then we come to conspicuousness for that status seeker. Um, that is a big motivation for a lot of us when we buy a luxury brand, we're looking for social acceptance and to kind of position ourselves within our social group. So here is the Veuve Clicquot label. When you have a package that is very recognizable, so this orange color is iconic and we know what brand that is when we see it across the room. And we know that it's expensive and we know that it's high quality. So we're, we're presenting a badge to the world when we have a bottle of Clicquot on our table that we have good taste. So distinctive color can be one way to do that. And one thing about this package that is so successful is they have not only used a very unexpected and intense color, but also layered in lots of richness into the label so that they're um, 
the, the tradition and the heritage and um, careful attention to detail is conveyed as well. It's not just a stark, bright colored package. A unique and recognizable structure that can also be recognized from far away for those in the know is another way to sort of broadcast to your audience, if you will. So be that uh, the rest of the restaurant or bar that you're in or the guests that you've invited to your home. This package conveys luxury and infers status onto the individual who has purchased it. And then we have uniqueness. So things like bottle numbering not only convey that this is a limited production, so therefore it's rare and somewhat unique, uh, but also each bottle feels more precious and more special that you, you have bottle number three, 538. You know, nobody else has that bottle. And then also on this package, we've got a custom cast metal wind vane that is very unique and um, makes the product feel really valuable and special. So extended self. One way to um, convey your, your social discernment, your, your, your good taste, and have that validated uh, within your social circle is a brand that has a celebrity endorsement. So here we have um, <laughs> our, our David Beckham, who is very, not only very handsome, but also he is an elite athlete. He is very wealthy and he's, he's, um, his public image is one of, of great taste and style. So his endorsement of the Hague Club um, Scotch is something that confers a high accepted luxury value for that brand. And then we have a few other ways that we project discernment. So critical rate ratings is something that isn't necessarily a packaging element, but it is a really valuable way to broadcast uh, by an expert that this is a very high quality. And then we have things like heritage. The Gabbiano brand was established in 1124. And that implies um, a lot of expertise and a lot of uh, history and romance within that statement. And then things like a seal that convey the prestigious appellation on a wine um, in, a, in a way that the consumer can both see, oh, this is a stamp of approval. This is a an element that is telling me this is special, but also delivering some key information that this is the Shalom Appalachian. So that concludes our prepared remarks, but before we get to the question and answer, I want to invite everybody who is not already a member of Women of the Vine and Spirits to join. This is the world's leading membership alliance dedicated to the support and advancement of women in the alcohol beverage industry. And you can join by going to that URL at the bottom of this image. And if your company that you work for, if your employer is a corporate partner of Women of the Vine and Spirits, your membership as an individual is free within that um, employee status. So please check and see if your employer is a corporate partner. And if not, you might encourage them to become one because Women of the Vine and Spirits has become more than just an organization it's become a movement and for those of you who are already members and were able to attend the event uh, the last couple of years the symposium that happens in the spring you know what it is to be able to connect with with high-powered women and hear about ways to advance your career and be inspired so i would encourage you to join and um, here's where to reach me and Franck, should you have more questions or want to connect with us for any reason, we're both very accessible. Yes. And now, yeah, let's get to Q&A. Um, so let me see here. I'm going to scroll back to 
First of all, Sandra Hess has a comment. Um, she's the founder of the DTC Wine Workshops Consulting Agency here, and she really appreciates Frank's um, information and would and like to invite him to come visit her in the wine country next time he's in California, which he spends the school year in California teaching. So he may yes, take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, September um, to May I'm in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, Liza Butler is asking, can we speak to naming, specifically hard to pronounce names like verve and how it relates to luxury perception? Frank, do you have some thoughts on that? Yes. There is, um, at one time I said that the brand luxury index uh, does, does evaluate luxury brands and it solves a lot of problems in evaluating luxury brands, but it doesn't do it all. So some elements which are not in the BLI are tradition, heritage, and the reason why tradition and heritage are not in the BLI is because um, a luxury brand is not more luxurious if it has more heritage or more tradition. It has for some people and it has not for some others. So what's interesting is the more it's, the more, just to take an example, the more something is expensive, the more it's, it is therefore likely to be luxurious. But the more is something traditional, that doesn't make it more luxurious per se for everyone. Um, and it's not like old people like it more traditional and young people like it more modern. No, it's, you cannot totally predict who likes to be more um, luxury brands with tradition or with less tradition. So it's not inside. That is not to say that tradition and heritage are not important in luxury, but it's a, another component that you have to look at very thoroughly. And the component, I, I call it another dimension, the dimension I call it authenticity. Authenticity is very important to me when I do design, for example, because, and I think that's a big problem sometimes for designers and working with our clients, is they need to understand what is authenticity for the client and authenticity for the target. So if authenticity is just for the target, then the client may not be very comfortable with the authenticity that they're trying to communicate. So there needs to be a very deep, and sometimes it doesn't work, uh, between one designer and one client. They need to be uh, a, a, a mind, uh, how do they call it, um, a collision of the mind or whatever it's called for the designer to understand the client and understand what is their authenticity and what is the authenticity of the target and then put it together for this to work. Otherwise, it's fake. So when it comes to the naming, it's the same. If the naming is not authentic, it's unlikely to be... Um, to be uh, working. For example, my last name, Frank Wigner, means winemaker. In America, sometimes they asked me if I made up my name so that way I could work in the industry better in the United States. And I say no. And they say, wow, so that must have been destiny. Well, it's a destiny that started a long time ago because my ancestors started uh, in the wine industry uh, 54 years uh, BC. So then the, the point is that authenticity of the name sometimes is, is very important and having a very difficult name to say may be a good thing because that um, improves people understanding that it must be real. So you have a difficult French name to say and it's a champagne, maybe it's a real champagne, right? Because of this. So naming is very important. I always think about the example of Agendas. Agendas mm -hmm. was a name that was uh, generated by a computer in order to be per perceived as a luxury or like a, a hyper quality uh, ice cream. So you can imagine these computers um, sp speeding names, hundreds of names, and then those are being reviewed by a, a lawyer, and then they're looking at them as the one are available, but also the one that makes the, the brand look like it's authentic. You know, when I think Agendas belongs to a huge food corporation, and it's, it's great, but it's not what people think, maybe. You know, it's yeah. not German or anything like this. <laughs> yeah. You know. I, and I think the other thing about naming um, and authenticity is that a difficult to pronounce name um, creates a certain amount of exclusivity because if if you have to 
find out how to pronounce it or be exposed to somebody who does know how to pronounce it, that is that that makes it more uh, inaccessible in yes. a way, which I think elevates its luxury perception at the very high tier. If we're talking about the lower end, the borderline luxury, mastige brands, um, who are are those are really targeting people who are aspirational and they are maybe less confident um, in their own taste and they are going to be maybe less comfortable saying something wrong. Um, so would you agree, Frank, that it's it's kind of the complexity of saying the name or the, oh, yes. the unfamiliar of the name? Yeah. And I have a good example with uh, the name of my cognac company because when I started in the U.S., uh, the brand in 2009, people were asking me how you say it. And I was having a hard time for people to remember the name. And there was a lot of people interested in cognac that had to do with rapper. So rap, and I was dealing with a lot of rapper celebrities at the beginning, uh. which I don't anymore. And so <laughs> they were asking me, what's the name of cognac? So I was telling them, it's like, come and down. So it's come and down. Like, hey, man, come and down. <laughs> and so they, they liked that. They went, oh, yeah, Konya, come and down. But then eventually I realized that this was not my target at all and I should not work within this, this something else. And people said, don't butcher your name. Your name is Commandant. So it's Commandant. And Commandant, they said, oh, this is harder to say, but it's so much more beautiful than come and down. So eventually it's exactly what you're saying. So I actually made the mistake originally trying to make it easier butchering the name i actually went back to making it harder but it's, that's the way it is and people find it more fancy the way it should be than trying to americanize it in a way so yeah that's, so yeah you learn make mistakes you learn and, and so i agree you have to make adjustments um, and not try to, to to simplify sometimes it's 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 a balance i suppose yeah so lisa butler uh, is also asking, do you, how do you foresee packaging being impacted as purchases become more of a digital online transaction? And I think that the package is still very important because once the consumer receives the product, that will be the visible, the visual experience of that product. And with digital, you know, websites and bandwidth and image resolution improving, we can see a lot of the package before purchase often. That yes. being said, I think building the rest of the brand imagery that is going to convey the luxury and support the brand's um, messaging through the website, through social media, etc. That is, is increasingly important. I mean, it used to be we would only see those advertisements in certain contexts. Um, but now we probably see social media and web um, representations of a brand more often than we actually see the brand physically in the flesh, <laughs> if you will. So I think that it's um, an evolving area, but that would be my take on it, is that the packaging is still really important and obviously having really stunning photography of the package that brings out the details is important. And then extending that expression of who the brand is and what it looks like into all of the other touch points for consumers is as important. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I totally agree with this. And if I may add, um, from a brand owner perspective, what I've seen the biggest difference is my expenses in terms of photography. I used to have good photographers taking pictures. And now because of social media and all that, I'm using people that are um, in New York. And one day they do Marie Claire. And then the other day they do one of my bottles. That cost me an arm and a leg versus before it was just like a friend, you know, used to do it. So now you can't do a friend anymore. You have to hire people that are very good. But because everyone is hiring people that are better and better, sometimes the pictures are unrealistic of what the product <laughs> looks like when you actually get it. And so sometimes I have a really good product, but the photographer is so phenomenal that they take so many different pictures from different angles so they get the lighting to be perfect so they are like slices of pictures but when you see the, the product you can never see it the way it was actually photoshopped and doctored 
And so that's another, so that's why I join you is you have to be very careful of the representation of the product. And it has happened the opposite way where nobody could take a, a picture that was very representative of what the product was. So it's, you, just, you just keep working at it. And you, what I think is very important like you is you need to make sure that they're not going to be disappointed when they see the product. Right. That's the most important. Yep. I think that's a really great point. Um, all right. So let's see. I, uh, Nicole is wondering, um, do you anticipate any new packaging trends in the luxury category? And one thing that is happening now and is trending is the use of alternative materials. There's a lot of interesting materials that can now be incorporated into commercial production of packaging. So um, things like cork um, uh, substrates for labels and um, leather I've seen, you know, where you can do an embossed leather label or that cast metal medallion for the Windvane brand that we did. Those are, I think, a, a newer packaging trend that was used at the very, very high end of the spectrum of luxury for quite a while, where the margins are really much larger and, and people could afford to invest a lot in packaging. Now, those elements, while still significantly more important and expensive than a conventional package, are more accessible than they've ever been from a price point. And then the other thing that we're seeing is custom glass is um, for alcohol beverage in particular. The custom bottle shapes are much more um, doable from a price standpoint than they used to be. And I am seeing a lot of really gorgeous glass being designed for brands. And I don't know, Frank, if you have any yeah, packaging well, I was trend. I going to just insights. say this because that yesterday I was with a, a number of people that, that are not so big a uh, glass making company and they are allowing you to do much more custom. So I was going to say that. Um, another thing that I was going to say, and I don't want to divulge too many things if I have competitors listening, but anyway, it's the <laughs> idea also of, of cross, uh, looking across, you know, as looking at the packaging within the realm and then uh, use these within tequila and, and cross using references that you learn from one category to the other. I find it also very interesting because it means that you can be making, in my situation, I use a lot of whiskey codes and design elements within, for my brandies. And so I think that's great going across categories. Yeah, and even categories outside, you know, beyond that. So fragrance packaging and yeah. um, even fashion, you know, it's, it's, it's not a direct translation necessarily to a package, but I think what some of the high-end fashion houses have done, like Chanel, for instance, in maintaining the prestige perception while also, you know, talking to the, the rest of us who maybe don't have the funds to be able to purchase the uh, Chanel haute couture, I think that is really um, another area to maybe look for inspiration. Um, okay. Let's see. There are a certain set of expectations around luxury cues. What is what about the edgy rough brands that are still luxury? So I think we've talked a lot about polish, you know, maybe implicitly, but there is sort of a um, there are some brands that are more kind of rustic and um, maybe a little bit more contemporary and edgy in their style. So how would you, do, how do you see that fitting into um, our assessment of the brand's luxury index as well as those different consumer motivations? Well, I think it's, um, it's an issue related to the target. If the brand has, um has still a very classic look and they're making very little evolutions and they are not acting uh, by following any trends and so forth. It's because they, they are, usually it's possible that they have a leadership, you know, the management wants to go after certain targets and 
and the leadership may be old school, doesn't want to change. Or this company has multiple brands. And so they have one brand for a certain target, another brand for another target. And the brand that they have for that target sees that that target does not want too many changes. So they're staying, they're staying very rustic. I'm thinking, for example, of Benedictine. If you look at Benedictine, it's a liquor. Um, which has also a second product that is very famous in America, it was created for America, called B&B from Benedictine. The bottle has not changed maybe for 30 years or something, maybe more even. And so they're not changing because, maybe they should, but they're not changing <laughs> because maybe they are thinking, uh, putting some other resources on other brands to go after a, a different crowd than the classic, and they're keeping that one for the classic. And... Um, that may be the reason because multiple brands. The, the reality is I think you need to evolve. Um, maybe some brands you don't need to evolve as much, but I think evolution is, is necessary. And, um, and it's always looking at w what the customer wants, but you're not doing exactly what they want. Anytime they change, you need to have your own identity, your own DNA, but you have to evolve at the same time so that way you, you're still uh, contemporary and you're still relevant to your customers. Yeah, and I, I think that um, the the idea of kind of edgier, rougher brands. There's two things that come to mind while Frank was talking, and one is that there are those brands out there that we're all familiar with that we as packaging designers and um, Lisa, I think you you might be a packaging designer. Um, they're just bad. The packages are just really out of date. They're just not sophisticated looking. And yet there's some, there is a quality that there is a, a kind of a communication that comes along with that in that, um, you know, we've been around so long and we're so good that we don't need to care about being super polished. So there, there is kind of an implicit communication there that can work for a brand. I think there's a, um, a fine line between becoming irrelevant and no longer feeling luxury if you hang on too long to the heritage, um, which is why we usually recommend for our clients subtle evolutionary refreshes on a brand like that, where you don't want to communicate, you don't want to communicate to your audience that you're now very slick in corporate. Um, that is the risk of doing something really polished and the benefit of something that's a little edgier and rougher is it does feel more handmade. It feels like it comes from a smaller producer. Um, that super sophisticated polish can end up feeling too slick and inauthentic, as Frank was talking about. So any other questions? I think that we're past the top of the hour here. We've lost some of our attendees, but we still have quite a number on. So if there's one more question, feel free to pop it into the Q&A. And um, otherwise, we will look forward to having you join us on our next webcast, which is coming up on Tuesday, August 15th. And this one is going to be called The, the New Tastemakers. And the um, topic is sensory perception and how to use the newer research into sensory perception to increase brand enjoyment and therefore, of course, brand sales and loyalty. And that will be with uh, another Women of the Vine um, and Spirits member, Kathy Latour, who is a professor at Cornell University researching sensory perception and also lecturing about marketing. So we're looking forward to that. I don't see any other questions. So thank you so much, Frank. I, I oh, love this. I'm looking welcome. forward to watching the replay myself. <laughs> and those of you who are Women of the Vine and Spirits members got a bonus. Um, you should have received via email a um, copy of Frank's uh, Brand Luxury Index for your own use. So enjoy that. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webcast. Thank you. Very good. Thank you.